I think those seasons where you feel kind of like the naked branch, the naked tree, and you're like, I just want everyone to know. And again, it all has to do with our performance and looking good and wanting people to think that we're doing okay. God's like, hey, do you trust me? Right. Do you actually want to grow? Because I'm going to cut some good stuff off in your life so that you can grow. I'm going to prune things back that are flourishing in your life so that you can grow even more. And I think that is what we have to understand, that change and pain come with growth. Mm-hmm. And this place was is such a healing place. Seacoast has been a home that has healed us in ways we didn't even know we needed healing. And... You know, I was about a year in, I think, living here when I started to write that chapter in particular. And what I didn't realize was how much loss we actually went through um, as pastors, as leaders, as people. Um, And that was really where I was at in that season when I wrote it. And I think about people, like you said, when you just feel so stopped up and you can't move forward. A lot of times the assignment for us needs to be go home, shut the door, tell your kids not to come in because it's going to get ugly in there, and turn on some music that hits you in the heart and grieve and mourn and let yourself be comforted. I was laying in bed with heavy depression, didn't know that's what it was Mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm charging along. Right. And my second son comes in and he goes, Mom, are you going to die? And that's when I was like, wake up, sister. You have to deal with whatever is going on in here. Mm -hmm. And that was when a new level and layer of healing came into my life. Just because I don't believe or agree doesn't mean I can't learn from you. Why did you have to bring that up? (laughs) Okay, that one I'm super embarrassed about. (laughs) Do you like me? Do I like you? Yeah. As, a, as an individual or as, yeah, a, as, as a person? No, I like you. Okay, cool. Yeah. cool. And I don't have any interest in appearing to be stronger than I am. I ain't bowed to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. He gonna leave. You feel me? How do we love people who see the world differently than we do? What would it look like if we truly loved all of our neighbors? Could listening to their stories be the first step? This is Seacoast Church, and there's way more to talk about. I thought it was really funny when uh, someone, and I'm, I, I, gosh, I hope this reporter was joking, but they asked Travis Kelsey, he's like, hey, do you like, did you invent like the fade haircut? Oh. And he goes, he goes, he goes, he, he starts laughing, he goes, and it's February 1st too. Y'all throwing me to the wolves. <laughs> <laughs> did y'all hear what Chris oh. Rock said about Black History Month? Mm-mm. He's he's just like yeah. A lot of people say you know we're not a racist country. We've even given y'all a whole month, and he's just like yeah, the shortest month on the calendar and the coldest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, welcome to Seacoast Podcast. We've got <laughs> we've got Andy Andrew coming up. Uh, Jack, do you like Andy Andrew? What a weird question no, to ask me. What I, am I supposed to say? I'm just wondering. Yeah. Do you think she's a good teacher? What, what again? What are you? What are you, we doing here? I, we're yeah, podcasting. Do. <laughs> do you think she's a good teacher? Yeah. Do you think she's better than Lynn? Ooh, <laughs> it's Black History Month, Jack. You better remember that. If you had Lynn and Andy hanging from a cliff, <laughs> one in each hand, and you can only one. pull one up. Oh no, that's easy because Lynn's the only one who actually helps me on the day to day job that Ooh. I need to have done. So I'm pulling one up real fast. I'm sorry. Andy, I apologize. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Yeah. That's funny. So it occurred to me, and I I did some research. Jack, you, you like that phrase? Have you? Tell- did you just go on Facebook? Because that's what most people mean when they say, I did some research. Tell- I thought that was so funny. Somebody at an all staff said, you know, I did some research. And you said something to me like, anybody who says they did some research. What- it's one of, well, I don't know if this is what I said. Because it, we, we throw it in there, and then we expect people, since I did research, y'all need to listen to what yeah. I said. Well, did I don't you know not if, hear? I did research. I don't know if this is what I said to you, but anytime I hear someone say, I did some research, and I know that the next thing they say is going to be one of the most ignorant things I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> All right, we have to pause just for a second here as the conversation is about to revolve around something minor that happened on social media. A very famous Christian was criticized on Twitter. So we're going to have a candid conversation about behavior in general on social media. Lots of opinions coming your way. And although no one in this conversation expresses nor likely even has personal opinions about this famous person... Her identity is irrelevant to the conversation, so we didn't include it. So please excuse us. We'd rather have a few bleeps in here than to be a juicy gossip podcast. (laughs) 
All right, Jack, do you like... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do you remember the Chris Farley show? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the, the, he was, like, super insecure. You know, I... I I've never read any of her books. I don't think I've listened to her a lot. But honestly, I like—I don't really know a lot about her. During COVID, my mom and I read, which was one of her new books together, um, and it was really good. It was my first like experience with right. her. Right. Listen to what she says. Uh, th- so this person on Twitter actually is is calling the modern day Mister Rogers, which I thought was a, f- a funny. Uh, title for her, but I do have to say how she handled uh, someone on Twitter was just marvelous. I'm going to read it word for word. So, was reflecting on Elizabeth Elliot and the recent revelations of her marriages, and so basically there seems to have been a lot of abuse in her third marriage, and tweeted something along the lines of, we should really slow down before we judge people who are in hard marriages or, or, or something like that. And someone immediately goes, you know, the whole, oh, are you watering down God's word? You saying divorce isn't that big of a deal? Just like, ah, bah, we're going to get you. We're going to get you for saying that. And she responds and she says, uh, I'll just make up a name. Jennifer, I'm going to tell you why I don't dialogue with you in the event I've misunderstood you. It seems to me you only address me when you don't like what I say and you want to take me on. And this person does have, you know, somewhat of a, a following uh, so I guess they're a voice out there, whatever you want to call it. Twitter wore me out on that kind of interaction ages ago. It's exhausting and it only leads to more doubling down. I like to dialogue with people on here who appear to see more complexity in their fellow humans who live in a bit of tension like I do and wrestle like I do and don't see everything as a side to be on and every matter as cut and dry. I like discussions in which, for instance, compassion is not at odds with biblical conviction. I also like humor, and I bet you can really be funny, Jennifer, and I'd love to see that side of you. All to say I have zero interest in the battle of the blondes. The thing is, I do have interest in you as a person, as a woman, and particularly as a fellow woman of faith. I bet you are wonderful to really get to know, and I have to wonder if all that public certainty is that certain in the dark of night. Then she ends with, one thing worries me on your behalf. I worry that the Christian far right with whom you presently have favor will turn on you the moment you do not serve their interest. I hope I'm wrong. I'm just saying, be careful. You're far more disposable to them than you can imagine, and you are worth more than that. Isn't that good? Not really? I thought it was just, I thought it was great. I thought it was a great way of articulating why the 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 frailty of going back and forth on on someone on Twitter and the humanizing it's almost like a humanizing without knowledge of the person you know they're human but you you haven't met them but you're still deciding I'm humanizing this person that I'll probably never get to know y'all seem a little neutral I thought that yeah. was beautiful well I I just feel like that I don't know I feel some kind of way about Twitter so I'm like any response at all to me is like I don't I don't really understand the Twitter world. So like I guess. you're playing the game. Yeah. Yeah. It, whatever response is part of the is part of the thing. So I don't know. Mm. I mean Yeah. I feel like that's a very Christian bless her heart way. Yeah. Really? Like, yeah. Really? Like, wow. Like this is like, interesting. You know what? You're dumb and I'm gonna just let you know that, you know, I love to talk to you, but not a like this. Like Gosh. this is really a waste of time. See, I think she did a wonderful job nailing what what the problem is. Okay. Is is how we want to have conversations. How we want to because this person who who uh, antagonized whatever you want to call it, their objective is to be able to say, "See, that's what she thinks." Don't listen to the the whole canceling mentality. Here's the thing about Twitter: you, you don't post anything on Twitter that you don't intend the entire world to see. Right. And so one of the things. So one of the things for me that that tweet kind of does is so it makes the person who posts it look good. And there might be nothing wrong with what she wrote. What she wrote might be fine, but you're still posting it on a public forum for everyone to see. And doing that puts you here and it puts the other person a little bit lower. And that's not productive either, Mm -hmm. in my view. Um, And now, look, maybe she, you know, you know, got 
person's contact information, send her an email separate. Like, I, you know, I don't know what else she might have done. But, I, you know, the thing is, I've been on Twitter for too long. You actually like Twitter, right? Um, I, I do, but it's just... <laughs> I do. It's become <laughs> awful. It really has. Um, it, it really just has become an unpleasant place. And one of the things I realized years ago is there is not a single person on Twitter that... Ah, uh, that's not true. There there's might be one or two. But by and large, there aren't any people on Twitter that I have more respect for now than when I started following them. In like Twitter as a platform debases you and it feeds your worst instincts about how to interact with other people mm-hmm. universally. Um, and to me, yeah, I thought that's a great way of putting it. That's very much a bless your heart kind of response, I think. Mm. And, uh, you know, that same thing sent privately in an email, I'd probably feel very differently about it. But when you post it for, and I'm sure X followers compared to whoever else. Close to a million now. Right. So you're really, you're not sending that to one person. You're sending that to a million people. I, I see that. First of all, I don't think anyone's motivations are ever 100% pure. So let's just say or thought to herself, you know, or, or maybe didn't even consciously think, this is going to make me look good. That we would all probably say, well, that's probably not good motivation. But what's wrong with someone like says, I have a huge following. I want to turn, I want to, I want to be a part, even if it's a small part, of turning the tide and showing people that we don't have to do this anymore. Like, what would there be a time for someone with a platform to say, I want to say this because it'll be helpful for people? But is there a way to say that without responding? Wait, wait, wait. To the Let's comment? talk about the face. Did you see Jack's face? I feel like I thought that was very much a Jack the Greater face. I got, I got that face from my dad. <laughs> a very what? Cynical? Is that a good word? No. Disgust? No. Uh, maybe an oh please. Oh phase. please. I just. Which is borderline bless, disgust. Bless uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Bless, yeah. Bless your heart, bless Joey. Bless your heart. Um. That's not what Twitter is for. It's just not. It, it, that's not what Twitter does. It's not what it's for. And if you don't understand that about the platform, then you, you don't know what you're doing. What if somebody wants to use it for that? Redeem it. All right. Another look by Jacqueline. <laughs> what were you <laughs> Mm. <laughs> I'm that actually, one I, was disgusting. Yes. Hey, <laughs> yes, I, that was. I love the fact. I love the and, fact that you guys are more. It's probably wisdom also, so I'll throw in wiser than me, but I think y'all are more cynical than I am. I just I, feel, I feel like, really like good that about that. Like, what that if someone wanted re- to do something good with Twitter? And, it's like, and each time Sisyphus got that boulder to the top of the hill, he's like, this time for sure. <laughs> Why are you so against someone like saying <laughs> people don't need to act this way, and I've got a huge following. I would love to does articulate that, why. Does that response... Just thinking about, we don't know either one of these women. Um, what is the likelihood that that response changed the other woman's heart? Yeah. And even the end of it, the like the end of it that Just you're so like, you know, I you're, don't drop you. You're a pawn yeah. for the, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. like that. that. I mean, so that was a dig. Mm-hmm. Like that yeah. wasn't that. That so anyway, all that to say, like if you even the idea of like using the platform to teach people how to interact. It's like, I don't, I just don't know that you teach people how to interact Mm -hmm. and in responding to comments. Would it, would it be different if this was on a blog that people subscribe to and she said, I had an interaction or I had someone say something on Twitter and I just want to write on the blog some thoughts about that. And it was not on Twitter. Would that be different to you? Yes. Okay. Well, so, so here's what this is like. This would be like taking it, like paying to have an open letter put in the New York Times and addressing this person that way. That, that, that's really an open letter to the person for everyone to read. And open letters are designed to attract attention to your position and make you look good and have people agree with you. It has no, like open letters are about you advancing your position, not trying to make things better. The other thing I would say, because and this is the last thing I'll say about this, is this is here's what this makes me think. Of. And then we'll end this conversation. Oh, but I got something to say. No, 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 that's all I'll say. You, like, I, I'm, I'm saying, I'm Jack basically said, much. I have the last word. No. <laughs> I'm saying I am trying to have a last word I know. of mine. I know. Golly, <laughs> unfair. Um, here's what this reminds me of, actually. So I've got two boys, um, and. Uh, 
sometimes when the older one doesn't want to do something I've asked him to do, the younger one will immediately go, Daddy, I'd love to do that. His motives are suspect, <laughs> right? He, he loves as, he, you know, this little brother energy. He, he knows the, like the, hey, you, you know, Jack doesn't want to do something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be good. I'm going to be the good one. I just feel like that's like kind of little brother energy. <laughs> like sin- I'm, I'm going to be the good one. <laughs> Sincerely, if she was wanting to do right by this lady, her response is, hey, I would love to have a conversation, not a confrontation. If you truly want to discuss this, DM me. Yep. Mm. That's it. Mm-hmm. And then she just showed the world how to have a conversation. That's gotcha. it. She's no good. I agree with you guys. <laughs> Nobody I totally that. agree with you guys. See, if you'd only done your research, Joey. <laughs> the minute you drop this, Seacoast podcast is going to get canceled. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it'll be deleted. So, moving on to Andy, Andrew. Uh, so, Jack, you think she's a good addition to Seacoast? It's just in general. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, Andy's great. <laughs> I don't like. She's just not worth saving over Lynn. Well, listen again. (laughs) Jack's like, why don't you ask Lynn and T about Andy? (laughs) Listen, listen again. It's just purely pragmatic. Okay, Lynn gets emails out, right, for the team. She has all of this knowledge. I, you know, I love Andy, but all right. Well, and I got stuff. She got. We got stuff to do. Yeah, it's about Jack. Uh, Andy Andrew on her new book, Braving Change. You guys are gonna love this conversation. Well, I don't know if they'll love it or not. That seemed like a braggy thing on my part. You've been wrong about everything you've brought up so far. (laughs) (laughs) He's researched it, and you're going to like it. That's right. (laughs) All right, so braving change. Uh, Yes. And you are in the middle (laughs) of some braving change. Yes, as we record this podcast. You're in the middle of moving. Uh, Yeah. Like, there's a part of me that wants to know, Andy, you know that you could have texted me and said, I'm going to pick another week. But I'm a glutton for punishment, you know? <laughs> and, you know, let my yes be yes and my no be no. And I definitely know that I could have done that. But then I'm also like, then we cram it into another week, right? right? And Might I, as well get it. Might as well. Yep. What's so crazy is I knew I wasn't supposed to travel this January as we did our calendar meeting. And I was thinking, oh, I'm going to have a month of rest before mm. I get into travel. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? And you didn't know you were moving at the no, time, I guess, when we you got that know. vision. The right place came up, and we went for it, and this was the month to move. Yep. And so, therefore, instead of rest, I'm packing and moving and waiting for shipments to come in, and we're going to live without a couch for a couple of days and a table and there you go. just sit on the floor. Get yeah. pizza. Yeah. Eat awesome. off the, You know, it's awesome. going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> Are you the type of person where if you had everything at your disposal to go ahead and set everything up, you would just stay up through the yes, night? 100%. You would just have to get it done, but you don't have what it no. takes to set it so up. So there's a part of me where I've had to already get into the mindset, it's going to take a little while and you're going to need to be okay yeah. with things not being complete. So... That's yeah. That's where I'm at. Right. But yes, if we move and we have everything, I am the weird person. I'm like, dun, dun, dun. like I'll just get it done, because then you can just sit in your home, you mm-hmm. know. So I love that. Mm-hmm. But that's not going to happen. Yeah, and I'm going to be okay. Yeah, you're going to be okay. <laughs> if somebody were to ask, like, so obviously you and I are podcasting, so yeah. we caught up a little bit when you came in here, mm-hmm. and now we're talking a little further. Going to go into your book, but if somebody that you know somewhat says, Andy, how are you doing right now? Would you say I'm pretty stressed? Ooh, um, would I be su- someone that so I know pretty that, no, well? Someone that you know cares about you and you care to tell them. 100%. And we did talk about that before I came in because I just left a voice memo with Irene, mm-hmm. <laughs> who you all know and love and mm-hmm. have heard her on the podcast. But it was one of those ones where I was like, oh, I'm I'm doing pretty good. But God just like rocked me and pinpointed something this morning that I was like, oh, right before we walk into the podcast, are we doing this right now? <laughs> God, I want to be okay. So yes, I think for me, knowing that is something that does help me stay stable in the midst of change and shifting and transition is to not isolate myself and not do it alone and not get too up in my head. I know I don't know if you've seen those memes and my husband always sends them to me, which is kind of offensive. But it's the ones where it's like, don't jump to conclusions. And then it says, also me. And then it's like, you know, the gymnast that flies through the air and misses the, you know, I'm like, 
what are you saying, babe? <laughs> the catastrophizing part of me that like goes down all of these trails I shouldn't go down. So Paul sends me those and then I'm like, Lord, am I doing that again? So I definitely need friends that go knock it off and yeah. love me well and encourage me. So yeah. yes, I definitely tell the truth when I need to. So it sounds like you need to read Braving Change. I, You're I think in I the need season to where actually reread it again. <laughs> Isn't that crazy though? Like, have you ever had the experience? And this this will be hard to answer mm-hmm. without sounding arrogant. I give you permission. I'm telling you it's happened to me before <laughs> where I've read something that yeah. I wrote down. I was yes. like, wow, yes. I needed to read that. Well, yes. Holy I'm, Spirit, you're smart, not Joey. Uh, <laughs> and I do feel that's what's so interesting to me is as I write a book or as I process something, um, God won't let me write anything that I haven't either walked through, been healed of, or you know what I mean? Have something that is tangible to give to something that's not like a weeping wound that right. I'm giving away. But um I think what is interesting, I do keep laughing. I'm like, are we, we're seriously doing this? Like the podcast, like the interviews, everything's lining up. And I'm like, where do I have time for this? And even the word for the year for me was like, eyes fixed, fix your eyes. I'm like, I am trying to fix my right. eyes. But you realize how, how hard of a job that actually is to stay focused in the middle of all yeah. the change. But yes, I definitely need to read my own book yeah. again. <laughs> <laughs> so I sent you, uh, it, it's uh, it's always, so I've been podcasting a long time. It's always uh, a little trickier territory talking about a book because mm-hmm. I'm reading through the stuff and I'm like, I would like to do a mini series on this. Yeah. It's just so much. And yeah. so it's one of those things to where we're going to dip our toes in a bunch of different areas. Mm-hmm. And then, but the, uh, I'm I'm glad that you didn't have to have a chance to look at the questions beforehand because I was going to tell you <laughs> so that because I was going to tell know, you I was like, like I was some of my prepared. <laughs> well no I mm. one of my questions was do you ever like did you read any of these questions and you're like either that was not coherent or I have no idea what the heck Joey is talking <laughs> about because I think a lot of questions I have for you will be right along yeah. the, the subjects of the books but then sometimes I'll get these weird like one one question that I want to get to mm. uh, before this conversation is is over has to do with heaven, something that we yeah. have no idea, but I yes. just like thinking about it. <laughs> I definitely will, would love to dive into that question. Yeah. So I was, I was like scanning right yeah, before I, we right. started. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, well, let me ask you this because I mm-hmm. don't know, I don't know this sort of background. So you and your husband, Paul, y'all, did y'all kind of start ministry together or, yeah. or had y'all, did y'all ever have separate life ministries? Yeah, we did. Y'all did. We basically had separate life ministries. Uh, you know, Paul was raised and grew up in Australia. Actually, his first job was with Christine Kane mm-hmm. <laughs> before she was she was Christine Karyophilus at the time. So both very young. He was young in ministry, worked for her, was part of Youth Alive, mm-hmm. toured, sang, did worship, um, all of that sort of stuff. And then I, you know, got saved in Spokane, Washington and right away started serving in the church that I was in literally the week I got saved. I I uh, dropped out of university, which I wouldn't recommend, uh, but <laughs> unless the Lord, you know, was calling you to do that, but did a first year at UW and then came home, got saved, and just really knew that what was on my life was to build a church. And I didn't know what that looked like. So I served in all different aspects of our church from, you know, kids to worship to youth and um, interned at the church and then um, moved to Bible college in Australia. And that's where I met Paul and our lives kind of converged together. And then we had, we did multiple different things in the church there. Uh, But yeah, we had ministry separate from each other. So that was very interesting. But then the moment we were married, we were so side by side, Mm -hmm. but yeah. So we yeah. did. So mm-hmm. at, was there a time when you taught on a Sunday and you were mm-hmm. like, hmm, I think this is something that I need to be doing more often. Like this mm-hmm. seems to be a calling on my life. I, I'm just trying to oh, put the yeah. pieces together as far as when did you discover that totally. you had a gift of teaching? When did that turn into, That's I think I want to write some of this stuff down yeah. in a book? Like, did, did you consider yourself that. a speaker before an author, author before a speaker? Yeah, well, you And know, I was you, even reading in your bio, and you didn't even mention author. Oh, my gosh, I didn't? But it may have been a bio oh my, to the book. That because, is so, so funny. We, we I'm all, like, <laughs> huh, I've written a few. I probably well, the, should write that down Well, somewhere. the thing is, is I'm reading, <laughs> I'm reading the promo of your book, so I, you're it. probably assuming that I know that you're an author <laughs> if it's a book. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Well, that it, it's so interesting because my daughter and I have been talking about this because even just recently, we've never pushed like ministry on our kids. I mm-hmm. know that sounds funny, but being church planters, oh, no, all I that sort it. of stuff, we're like, we want you to walk in the purpose God has for you. But recently she's been like, 
I think I'm called into ministry. And I'm like, oh. So just telling her, like, you don't, that's not like a, and this is the exact lane I'm going to run in. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think for most of us, we look back on our life and you go, oh, like, I know this sounds like, tri- like, I used to win speech contests mm-hmm. all the time. Like, I had— Speech n- contests, spe- you said? Yeah. Spe- I, I was like, put me in. I yeah. love—I loved writing a speech and curating speeches. From the time I was in middle school and high school, I was never afraid. I loved it. Yeah. And I loved coming up with subjects that, that would, like, pull people in. So this is, like, before Jesus. Like, and even—I know cheerleading, I know this sounds funny, but they would always put me in as lead to rally the crowd in moments. So it's like little things like that where there were parts of me that were were good at this. Then I get saved and I fall in love with the word, moved to Sydney, and I was leading in young adults. And they said, this is when I discovered, I was uh-huh. like, oh, I love, I think this is in me. Like, I feel like I'm running in all the things that maybe you've called me to is uh, the young adults pastor said, let's get together and everyone bring a five minute message. Never done that before. And we'll critique each other. And the moment I got up there and pre- it was like something just locked in my life. Mm-hmm. And they were just like, oh, you can do this. And then you saw li- flames on their heads. I, didn't they you? did. I saw flames of fire. <laughs> I was like, is everyone okay? Um, but it was then from there, it was like little things. Like I never knocked on any doors. Like yeah. opportunities just kept coming up. And even when we like to, to speak, sure. like in, in church and youth and women moved to America, doors just naturally opened up for it. And then my husband and I, you know, when we planted the church, did that. Um, he'd preach one week, I'd preach the other week till we raised up a teaching team. But then um, with writing, I just, I always loved writing in school, always loved even just the process of sitting down with God, hearing, writing, studying. And um, it just, it was kind of like something locked and loaded. And it got to a point where when I wrote my first book, She Is Free, I felt like I was in a season where I was being disobedient to not move toward it. Uh, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally. So I just started to reach out to some of the connections I had and just knocked on the right doors and saw what opened and what closed. And that's kind of what ended up happening where the first book deal came in. And then it just rolled out from yeah. there. Yeah. 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 I actually, so being, I mean, I say I've been a Christian my whole life. I think that's pretty, you know, accurate. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. something as I got older that I would practice, why my, the light bulb went off when you said what you said is there will be times where I feel like God is really making a certain direction clear. And the and the way that I determine whether where I think it's God is I will say, okay, if that's God, I'm going to try to shut it out completely <laughs> and go my own. And, wow. and it really is a practice to where it's like, I can't do that. There's no way possible that I can do mm. that. because And, and that, that's when the signal goes off. It's like, okay, this is something that I'm stuck with. I have yes. to walk in yeah. this. But that's something that I'll do is I'll pretend no like I'm not going to do it at not all. Gonna, like, a, like literally like <laughs> right. your little kids do. You're like, I'm not going to do that. Right. And God's like, that's cute. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. All right, so you're going through a lot of change right yeah. now, but you you're releasing a book called Braving, Braving Change. Change. So why why did you write the book? Well, it's so interesting because even the subtitle speaks to so much of that. Release the past, mm-hmm. welcome growth, and trust where God is leading you. I think for me, this book has been in the works for years. And a lot of it has to do with control issues and grief and letting go. Yeah. Like I, I think what frustrated me, I got to a point in pastoring in New York City, which is a very transient city. And our mindset was, you know, almost we had a suburban mindset at, at the start in planting in a city, which was the wrong mindset. Uh-huh. We didn't realize, but it was like, these people are going to be here forever. They're not. There are a handful of people that still go to Liberty Church to this day that are New Yorkers that are there, born and bred, but it is a transient city. And I think it started with the pastoring of people and pouring your life out and the grief and the loss of losing people, people mm-hmm. coming and going. And then the Lord just saying, hey, change is the only constant. Now, Andy, transition can either teach you or it can take you out, but you get to choose. And so he started to like lovingly guide me even through scripture and watching the Israelites and how God was trying to move them through change. Because I think what we do in our Christianity is we cry out for change. We're like, God, change my heart, change my mind. And then he starts to, and we're like, no, can't. Um, time out, God. Like, I have a different way I would like you to change my life. (laughs) And here's my blueprint. Can you bless it? And he says, no, because I know who you are and I know what you need. And um, 
And a lot of times what we do is we're looking for the meat pots of the past when God has moved us on. So can we release the past of the meat pots in Egypt? Can we trust Him in the desert and tr- mm-hmm. and trust where He's leading us into the promised land, even though that a lot of times we have to go to war to even take what He has for us? Yeah. And so I think it started with that where l- literally this is a book that is birthed out of years of God really discipling me mm-hmm. through the Word, through His Spirit, through grace and loss and um and even pastoring through 2020 i realized as this came out w- that we're stepping into another election year and my yeah. prayer is that it will be a tool for people in the shifting of seasons because governments rise and governments fall and if we put our trust in those things and we build them on the wrong things just like it says at the end of the sermon of the mountain that's kind of the the key scripture is at the end of matthew 7 when Jesus has just literally taught these words where he is saying, we're going entering from an old covenant into a new covenant. And this is what it looks like. And as you read the Sermon on the Mount, it's difficult to mm-hmm. live. But he says, but if you do this, if you listen to my teaching, and you don't just listen to it, you actually do it. You are building your life on the rock. And when the storms come, because isn't that interesting? He's like, and then the storms won't come. He doesn't say they won't mm-hmm. come. When they come. When they come, you've built your life on the rock. But if you don't listen to my words and you don't build your life on the rock, you're building your life on the sand. When the storms come, everything will come crashing down. And I think over 2020, 2021, election years, all that changed and transpired, a lot of us found out where we built our lives on shifting sand. Mm-hmm. So my hope is it will be just a, a discipleship book, a good tool in the midst of change, whether that is the loss of a loved one, like cataclysmic or, you know, global changes or personal changes. You could be even a prayer that you ask for, God, thank you for this baby, but why does my life right, look like this right. now? So all over the place. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Just for a split second, there's something in my brain when you're saying uh, or you built it on shifting sand, just for a split second, I was like, is she, did she just going to say she, the S word? Build your life on. Did she just swear on our podcast? It's such a close. It's, you're like, oh, just let's go. Just for a split go. second, I'm like, all right, okay, bring, bring it. Andy's the bringing New York. it. Here we go. We are, we are not holding back. <laughs> You know, I'm I'm reading through your stuff and the the quotes in there, and it it makes me think about what I think could be God's. Like, if somebody said, "What do you think God's personal will is for me?" I think, and the, and and you can be like, mm-hmm. Joey, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but I think this sums it up as much as possible. And and I'm talking personally from God to me. I'm not talking about His Mm -hmm. calling for what I do in this world or anything. And I know they're all so very connected, but I think that God's ultimate will for you, for me, and for everybody else is to be less affected by the world Mm -hmm. and less connected to it Mm -hmm. and more connected to God. I yeah. mean, just and our contentment resting on yeah. nothing in this life because that is shallow ground that could fall any single any second. second. And I think about the things that I see my kids struggle with, the mm-hmm. things that I struggle with, the things that I talk to other people, and it all boils down to when I'm struggling with something is typically because I'm very connected to the world when it comes to what I'm struggling with. 100%. And I think it's like we forget that there is a battle going on Mm -hmm. against two kingdoms. Yeah. And it's just whether we see it, acknowledge it or not. And we are built in these flesh bodies. Like, it's not like Jesus didn't know. That's why He became flesh, to understand. But yes, you're right. I think any time that we get caught up, just like even my phone call with my friend before, or my voice memo, uh, before we jumped into the podcast, I was like, ah, I'm getting caught up in things that don't matter, like really don't matter. What am I building my life on? That's Mm -hmm. so good. Mm -hmm. I I agree with that. Yeah. (laughs) You write about the relationship between change and growth. Mm. I'd Mm -hmm. love for you to just to elaborate that because I think it'll set a good foundation for the rest of stuff that we talk about. Well, again, I think, um, if gosh, a scripture that has been a life scripture, I need to tattoo it somewhere. Sorry if tattoos are offensive to anyone listening, but um, <laughs> is John 15. They're listening to the wrong podcast. <laughs> it's the wrong <laughs> podcast. Uh, but that was also John 15. John 15 has been like such a stable scripture for me over the last little while, realizing that God is like, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know where in your theology, Andy, you thought 
that growth would just be this thing that is like beautiful Mm -hmm. and easy. And it's like, no, your grief brings growth. Your pain brings growth. And John 15 is like this highly offensive and beautiful scripture all at the same time, because Jesus is saying, hey, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you will remain in me, I will remain in you. And then he talks about My father is the gardener. So what's he going to do? If he wants us to grow, he's going to cut off those things that are bearing no fruit. Mm -hmm. And that's always hard too, because you're like, whoa, I thought that was a good thing. He's like, you did, but it's not. And it's not bearing any fruit in your life. And he even prunes back the things that are bringing growth in your life so that you can be fruitful. And I think those seasons where you feel kind of like the naked branch, the naked tree, and you're like, I just want everyone to know. And again, it all has to do with our performance and looking good and wanting people to think that we're doing okay. God's like, hey, do you trust me? Do you actually want to grow? Because I'm going to cut some good stuff off in your life so that you can grow. I'm going to prune things back that are flourishing in your life so that you can grow even more. And I think that is what we have to understand, that change and pain come with growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I've heard the the terminology suffering well. Yeah. And that just clicks because, and it it goes along with what you're putting out in this Mm -hmm. book, is like you can let suffering stop you dead in your tracks. And if so, it makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. We understand how pain can stop someone dead in your tracks. But bottom line, the reality is there's no growth from there. Yeah, You can let it stop you dead in your tracks or you can meet it head on. Yeah, And then that's where growth comes from. Well, yeah, and that's why I talk a lot about grief in this chapter. The, I remember even writing the grief chapter. It was like I had to go into that place. Mm-hmm. I just wept writing that whole chapter. Do you mind sharing what your grief was yeah. based on? We— Shoot, I'm sorry, Andy. No, I'm, I'm a crier. You know this, and I'm okay with that. Um, that chapter, I just pray it ministers to so many people because— we had moved here, and this place was is such a healing place. Seacoast has been a home that has healed us in ways we didn't even know we needed healing. And, you know, I was about a year in, I think, living here when I started to write that chapter in particular. And what I didn't realize was how much loss we actually went through um, as pastors, as leaders, as people. Um, pouring our lives out in a city that we love so much and a people we love so much. And then there was just a lot of loss and pain in broken relationships and even saying goodbye, knowing we were doing the right thing, being obedient. And now we're watching the church even flourish and go past where we could have taken it. And I think it was just me being honest with myself. And and the reason why I didn't even go into grief when I first moved here was things were just so great. Right. And then I started to write this chapter. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I and that was really where I was at in that season when I wrote it. And I think about people, like you said, when you just feel so stopped up and you can't move forward. I pray that that chapter really encourages people because we can get caught in a part of the cycle of grief because there are reasons why there are steps in it and why we have to get to a place of acceptance yep. in the end of grief. Because we're like, that was hard. That sucks. That was painful. But I accept where I am today. And I accept that you are with me, God. And so, um, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the toughest challenges for me, and this this would fall into the category of whatever you say to this, I'm going to take it in. (laughs) And I also know that you and I don't have these answers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So for yeah. our listeners, like we don't we don't have concrete answers mm-hmm. to this. But I do think it's so important to think about like there are some times where, and I guess this is where the Holy Spirit comes into helping other people out, but there are some times where I think people need to hear, hey, just just rest in him. Yeah. Be still and know that he is Lord. Hey, his strength is made perfect in yes. your weakness. And then there are some times where people need to be told, you've got to walk. You've yes. got to get up. You've got to yeah. do something. God loves you. He's with you, but he's not going to do it for you. And it's it, it, it's 100%. like too, it feels conflicting mm-hmm. because their time. But but I think there's uh, it goes back to Ecclesiastes. There's yes. a time. There's a season for everything. There's a season where Joey Svensson, I have run out. Yeah. I don't have any answers. I don't yeah. have any strength. I don't have any energy. And I've got to be able to rest in him. And then there's other times where it's just like. 
okay, this is on me. Well, that I 100% agree with that. And that's discernment of reading your season well. And I actually, you know, recognize transition when you're in it. I think that is a huge part of understanding where you're at. What rhythm are you in right now? And what do you need? Like when we first moved here, all I knew was like serving on a team at a church and then planting our own church. So it was like, go, 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 yeah. traveling, travel. And then we get here and Pastor Josh and Lisa and uh, Pastor Joel are like, hey, it's okay. If you just sit here for a year and I'm like, I'm so sorry, what? <laughs> I don't, did you just say you don't need me? <laughs> uh, well, yes, they did. They said, we want you, but we don't need yeah. you. And I'm like, I really don't know what to do with that. Right. And I think... That whole first year was kind of like, oh, like yeah. figuring it out. Did and it so, feel good or or bad initially, or both. a mixture of both? It yeah. was both, yeah. and I think that 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 juxtaposition was really difficult, but also very necessary. Yeah. It was almost like an unraveling needed to happen. But then, I mean, even this year, it was like the Lord is saying to me, "Fix your eyes, Andy. Like, get up, stand up. I need you to be aware and awake and ready." And I'm like, it's almost like He was like, "Okay, now you have marching orders again." And I'm like, okay, I all right, let's do this. And so it is the both and. And I've I have friendships and people in my world where that's what I'll say is like sometimes I need to rub your back and hold you and bring you ice cream. And other times I'm like, I'm not doing this with you anymore. Mm-hmm. I can't fight for you anymore. You need to get up and fight for yeah. yourself. So you're right. It is that rhythm and understanding where you're at yeah. and not missing the season. Yeah. Yeah. You also talk about how grief is connected to our wholeness. Our wholeness. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Give us a little snapshot on that. See, yeah. we could do a whole podcast episode oh, on that one question, we Andy. We really could. <laughs> we really could. Well, there was one season in my life where I didn't know this until after the fact that grief had been stored up in my body. And I think that's what we realized. Like, it, it, the Lord says to us, He comforts those who mourn. Yeah. And a lot of times we feel alone. We don't feel comfortable comforted. We don't feel like anyone's with us. We feel isolated and alone, or we're being strong for everybody. I'm not going to cry. I'm the strong one. I've got to lead the family through this. But it's like a lot of times the assignment for us needs to be go home, shut the door, tell your kids not to come in because it's going to get ugly in there, and turn on some music that hits you in the heart and grieve and mourn and let yourself be comforted. So when I went through this season where I had like, because grief is in there, and it will come out somehow. It, it You can become, we know this, gut issues, physically ill, um, depression and heaviness. I've had literally all of those things happen in my life yep. when I have not processed grief well. And I found myself like in the hospital um, for a minor thing, but I realized it was, I mean, this is so gross. It was a staph infection, but it was it like lit, almost took me out. Dang. I had lost all of this weight. I was like emaciated. Like, and I realized, and this was pastoring through New York, I was laying in bed with heavy depression, didn't know that's what it was, because mm-hmm. you know, I'm charging along. Right. And my second son comes in and he goes, Mom, are you going to die? Dang. And that's when I was like, wake up, sister. You have to deal with whatever is going on in here. Mm -hmm. And that was when a new level and layer of healing came into my life. And I realized I hadn't grieved some losses properly. And honestly, as I did, and as I started to eat better and work out and move my body and deal with those spiritual issues and grieve, so much healing came to me. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, I, I love the thought of someone saying, God, what do I do now? And God says, mourn. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's scriptural. Yeah. That's why do you think they would put like sackcloth and ashes? Like their funerals were loud and obnoxious. It would make us uncomfortable in this day and age. And I'm like, some of us just literally need to embarrass ourselves at home. Right. <laughs> like, ah! yeah. like, or in the car. The car's so great. I missed having a yeah. car. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Where you can really be alone and just scream yeah. and cry if you need to, or laugh and sing really loud. Yeah. Like, whatever it is. Yeah. Cars are great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that really connected with me, what, what Paul says when he's talking about his thorn, is he goes into mm-hmm. saying, that's why I boast all the more gladly yes. in my weaknesses. And then he says, so that Christ's power may rest upon me, which is just going right along with what you're saying is if you don't go through the morning, you know, I don't even see it as God saying that I'm withholding my presence. It's you, you can't experience it because you're not 
basically coming to the table with weakness, asking for my strength. That's what you need right now. (laughs) Well, think about like when your kid hurts themselves and what's the first thing you want to do? You want to go scoop them up in your lap and you want to hold them and let them cry on your chest. But if you have a kid who doesn't like to be touched when they're in pain, it's really hard as a parent because they're like, just give me space. And like, I think there's kind of those two personalities in life too. And so the give me space people, because when you're in pain, you don't want anyone touching you. You have to recognize that in yourself and go, oh, I actually need to let the father close to me because this hurts and there's nobody else that can really heal me. So yeah. (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Have you had to figure out people pleasing when it comes to Andy knows what she needs. Mm -hmm. And let's say your mourning means that you're letting other people down. Mm -hmm. Like, have you had to work through that? Especially because I think that you deal with not only uh, personal people that you know personally Mm -hmm. and love, but you also feel compelled to minister to numbers of people that you don't know. And you could be letting... Yes. One set or both down. Oh my gosh. Yes. People pleasing and fear of man. And I always giggle. I have to like preface this fear, not fear of actual men, like it's in the yeah. Bible. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I've never thought of that. <laughs> I had someone say that. I was like saying something, you know, thinking everyone understood biblically what I was talking about. And they're like, the fear of man. <laughs> what do you mean, fear of man? I was like, oh, no, like scripturally, this is like bowing down to what man wants versus what God wants. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, you're clarify. not afraid of Paul, right? I, I mean, dead, he's safe. Right? <laughs> he's so safe. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Um, Um, But I think that has been a huge one for me is knowing to go, this is difficult for me to say no to. This is difficult for me to fix my eyes, if you will. This is difficult for me to take some space because it feels selfish. And I think a lot of times in this day and in this hour, we have so many people pulling on us that, that taking care of ourselves in an appropriate manner. I mean, it get done a lot quicker if we just go grieve, mourn, and then we can get back out there and go back to war. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times we prolong it or we please everybody else. And so it's just a matter of once again, being obedient to that nudge from the Holy Spirit when you hear it. It's like, come away with me, come yeah. on. And um, doing it quicker. Yeah. Otherwise it goes very quiet. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I a, a book called Braving Change, and I think about the amount of therapy that I've gotten in the last five years <laughs> and how mm-hmm. helpful it's been. And I think about the, you know, obviously there's many things that we benefit from in the 2020s, one being yeah. we really recognize mental health as a, as a totally. big deal. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I think about the past generations who never yeah. talked things out and didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. And and I, I I think about just how that is such a benefit nowadays, mm-hmm. but I also think about even people, my parents' generation, who they will never talk it out. There ha- mm-hmm. you know, there there are people that are going to go to their grave and they never talked yeah. it out. They never Ugh. grew. They never went past. I'm not, well, I wouldn't say they never grew, but they never got through what yeah. they needed to get through, yeah. which hindered a lot of growth. 100%. And that, that kills me to think that there are people that are going to forfeit freedom that they could have had. Yeah. You know? It does. It does break my heart. And I think it's just never too late. And I think even just encouraging every generation listening or watching, like, it is never too late to step into change. Like that's why I even called it braving change because it's like a lot of times accepting the fact that things are changing, whether that's in your physical body or becoming an empty nester or the loss of a spouse. When, you know, all of these things, it's like you can either shut that down Mm -hmm. and just be like, I'm going to barrel through or I'm going to brave this change. And so um, it's just never too late. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, for sure. All right, I got. I want you to unpack this. Sometimes yeah. that's our only directive. It is the only way to bear fruit, which is many a season I've heard the Lord whisper to my heart, I'm quoting you, uh, when you're longing for another word, and that's remain. Remain, remain, Our remain, only directive remain. sometimes. <laughs> that has been the hardest one. It's out of John 15 again. So again, you're going to see, you know, Matthew 7, John 15 a lot throughout this book. And I think it's really important to kind of massage certain scriptures in to get the reality of them. And uh, different versions say remain, others say abide. And I think that that has been the hardest for me is when I'm like, God, 
Where's the fruit in my life? God, I, and I think again, social media has become a vice and I'm going to speak for myself in my own life that I've had to constantly overcome Sure. where he's like, Andy, you don't need to post every little thing about how great you're doing or how bad you're doing or how any, it's like, just silence all of those voices and remain in me because at the end of your life, this is all that you have is me. And, yep. and so I think for me, that directive, when I'm, it's like, God, give me something else. Tell me what to do. Tell me where to grow. Tell me what to read. And he's like, abide in me as I abide in you. Yeah. And so, yeah, that is, that's been huge, especially in those dark seasons where you want to fix it, control it, you know, change it, change the narrative. And God's like, I, I think I'm just going to need you to do the simple thing and come back to remaining. Right. This book is, is complex and simple all at once. Yeah. And it's just kind of a pulling back to what really matters. Yeah. 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 All right. So here's an off the wall, Joey, spiritual question. Hit me. Do you think that there, do you think that there are times when we think too much on the so I, I mean there's definitely seasons of labor seasons of harvest and, mm-hmm. and all of that do you think spiritually sometimes we as Christians bank on harvest here on earth in forms that's only going to be in heaven like I, I think that sometimes we have yeah. like this continual optimism that I need more of honestly <laughs> Um, I love you, <laughs> but uh, but there are times mm-hmm. when I think that it's like we we want so badly for something where God's like, I mean, that's what heaven's going to be uh, yes. about. I, you don't necessarily get to see yes. the the heart, you know. Hello, the patriarchs. Yeah, I mean, a whole book or is it two in Hebrews is dedicated to like. They had faith and did not see. They had faith, right. like, and they didn't see the harvest on earth, but because they trusted God and they had this, they didn't just have a micro, like, view of God. They had a meta, a huge view of the almighty yeah. God. And so us understanding that, I mean, I hear my brother and sister-in-law say this all time, all the time, obedience is success. Obedience each day to that whisper. Obedience to God, laying your life down and not, like— I know there's a lot of jokes about like the prophetic word for yeah. this year, 2020, is breakthrough, is harvest, right. is abundance, like all these words that we want and we're yeah. like looking for on this earth. But you're right. We may never see some things on this earth, but will we be faithful right. in the season that we're in to sow the seeds that God has given us, whether we see the harvest or not? Do we trust that He's Lord of the harvest, whether we get to see it with our eyes or not? And that's really difficult, but I think the more we can live that way, the more satisfied we mm-hmm. really are in Him, yeah. truly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Tell me what you think, Andy. Do you think that? All right. So let's. I'm a. I'm gonna play a character of someone who gets. I'm. I'm a Christian. You're a Christian, but I okay. get stuck. I okay. get stuck, and I'll go three years thinking about something where God is saying, "Hey, come on, let's do this together. Let's move through this." You live a life of abiding, remaining, getting through things with God, learning. Yeah. I don't. I get stuck three years, four years here at a time. Are you going to be better off at the very least from a wisdom perspective in heaven? Isn't that a good question? Think about it. Like, cause I I, I mm. think I think Andy will. I, now I don't think I'll look at Andy. Yeah. There won't be any jealousy. I won't feel shortchanged. Yeah. We'll both be like, ooh, let the real learning begin. <laughs> but I do feel yeah. like there will be people who just open themselves up to that sort of challenge. And in heaven, they're going to be in a different place. Like, I don't think we're all just going to appear there and be right right at the same. Well, and even scripturally, it talks about reward. Like, there's reward on earth and there's reward in heaven. And we don't like to look at those, but I mean, they're there. Right. (laughs) And I do think when we get stuck, if you really think about what earth is, in a way, it's practice for the eternal. It's Mm -hmm. practice for heaven. So how do we live leaning into heaven while we're here on earth. What does that look like to see? Why why does the Lord's prayer tell us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven? Um, So that we're looking at what is your will? Why am I thinking about my will so much? Why am I focused on? So I do think, like, like you say, like there is a lot of scriptural backing to reward on earth, reward in heaven. And also like if you're completely fixated on yourself all the time, you forget to look up and see how good God is, even in the middle of your pain. I mean, how do people that are at war and in impoverished countries have the most joy in Christ? Mm-hmm. 
because they know how good he is even in the middle of pain. Yeah. And we're just so fixated on the physical. Right. And I think a lot of those people, they they don't have another option. Like yeah. you and I can there look at you Netflix. Go. You and I can oh go grab something that we like to eat. Pleasure. Like there's so many different things. So and then you've pleasures. got some demog- I mean, some, you know, sometimes I, I could get jealous of people that don't have anything. And then I'm like, eh, that lasted five seconds. Listen, <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. There was one season when we lived in New York. I was like, can we just leave and oh, yeah. go to another? I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Like hitting my head yeah. against a wall where I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. One more question. Then I this is this is how I take the challenge of trying to get through as much stuff. I've got a, I've got a speed round. I've got four it. questions. Okay, let's boom, do boom, it. boom. But before that, what has Andy done in the past when God at least seems silent to you? No. Um not only silent but absent. Or have you ever felt those times where you feel I think like for me, like I am a natural uh I would say from the time I like gave my life to Jesus, yeah. like I just have heard and understood and had a knowing and discerning and awareness of the presence of God and hearing of like even out of his word, like all of that has is a very natural way mm-hmm. for me to roll. Um, I have dreams, like all of that sort of stuff where I just feel like God speaks to me in the night hour. So when I do go through a season where I feel like I am uh, I'm reading my Bible daily. I'm praying, I'm listening, I'm sitting there, but I have definitely gone through seasons where, you know, I'm not like, here's a new revelation for today. Because I, it's almost like I banked on like revelation every single day. Yeah. And then there have been seasons where I'm like, hello, yeah. did you want to share anything cool with me? No, <laughs> no, any mysteries today? And so I think what I've had to battle in those seasons is, have I done something wrong? Mm-hmm. Are you withholding from me? Do I need to repent of something? And so those tend to be my wrestles. But what I do in those seasons is I continue in what I know until there is a breakthrough. And um, I can always hear God through His Scripture. So that is where I always encourage myself, but I'm always searching my heart. Search my heart, oh God, test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way and lead me in the way of everlasting. But I definitely have gone through those seasons and they're really difficult. Yeah. Um, so I just continue to dig in, even though it's hard. Yeah. 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 If you need some camaraderie, just read Psalms and read about but how he felt hello. alone. <laughs> hello. I, I feel his pain. <laughs> yeah. Where God, are why are you, you hiding God? your face? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> All right. So these last four questions, okay. he, here's how, so we can get through them because okay. I know we're running out of time. You can answer it any way you want, but if you want, you can say, here's how the book touches on these okay. things. Instead of telling people the answer got to these it. questions, here's how the book. So uh, body, soul, and spirit. Mm. I'd love uh, you to elaborate on how that works together and change yep. or what the book will tell people. I will talk, I'll touch on that really quickly. I'll yeah. do it really quickly. I am very passionate about wholeness because I, uh, even we were just talking about mental health. I think a lot of times we, um, we forget that it's like we need, healthy bodies. We need um, healthy minds and souls. And so that's why I'm like, I'll go to therapy all day, every day if I need to. I want to make sure that I'm taking care of my temple and eating well and working out. And do I do it perfect all the time? Absolutely not. So that's not what I'm talking about, but even deliverance. So that's something where we could probably do on a totally different podcast, which I would love to dig into is the spiritual aspect too, in a safe way. Um, Because for me, body, soul, spirit is the way that I, I I have had deliverance, um, and it was like in the safest form with this this guy who's written amazing books and was a friend of a friend. But I think for me, it's like paying attention to what you need in a season of change. Is, is there agreements that you've made where you need healing and deliverance, inner healing and deliverance? Do you need to sit in therapy because your mind is just in a place that's difficult? Or do you need to just get out and exercise and change the way you're eating? Right. Because in change, we all know this too, is you will go into certain um habits that you're like, oh, this is a bad habit. But in change and in transition, when we feel, if we don't feel the pain and walk through it properly, we will cope some other way. So I really break that down a lot in that chapter. That's cool. That's cool. During this uh, prayer and fasting, there's somebody on staff who's going to drink water for three weeks. Have you ever done that? Three Mm, weeks water? I haven't done three weeks, but um, it's hardcore. That person's pretty awesome. Yeah. I know who they are. They're yeah. amazing. Yeah. I'm, pray- I'm praying for that person. <laughs> praying Literally, for I'm praying for them. <laughs> My brother did a 40-day water fast. Dang. 
Dang. Yeah, he's he is the most hardcore person you yeah. will ever meet, and I love him for yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. All right, game plan for recovery. What are some actionable steps we can take to recover? Your book deals with that. Yeah, it does talk about that, and I think that's really important. Irene Rollins comes into play in that chapter because that was one where I was walking through a major transition, and she says, you're going to be okay, but we need a game plan. Game plan. And so I, that's what I really break down is what does that look like for you? So after you've walked through change or you're in the middle of it, you're going to need a game plan to to walk in recovery, which is redemption. Like, what does it look like for God to recover the losses? Because a lot of times in change, there's loss. So um, I really break that down and, and give, um, you know, helpful tools and help you to pause to look at what that game plan could be for you so that you don't just read a book, but you move through it and you have a strategic plan yeah. to walk forward. Yeah. And mm-hmm. going back to wholeness, you may need a physical trainer, a pastor, and a therapist. Yeah, right, you to made do it this. all of it. <laughs> you made all of it. How about in, uh, choosing integrity and in change? I, I definitely... Mm. That As one, you can tell, I haven't read the book yet. No, I plan it's on okay. It. I gotta, gotta That's know. why I give you the quotes. Yeah. Um, but that is a whole chapter. And I think a lot of times um, that's going to be a good one for a lot of people to leave. Because a lot of times when we walk through change or transition, we want to run a PR campaign for why we're doing what we're doing um, and throw other people under the bus. But how do we walk? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm doing this because so-and-so. And I'm like, okay, we all need to grow up and have a little <laughs> integrity and change. You don't need to throw everybody under the bus while you choose to make changes in your life. So that's one part of it. But there is a whole breakdown of what it looks like to have integrity as you walk through change and not need to crucify everybody else to make yourself look good. Awesome. It's a really good chapter. Awesome. (laughs) You do a good job at writing and podcasting. Good job. (laughs) Thank you so much. You've been listening to the things you won't hear on Sunday Seacoast Podcast. In the show notes, you'll see a link to our Facebook group page. Also, we'd love for you to consider subscribing so you get these episodes downloaded right when they come out. Thanks so much for listening.